But the Russian army continues to advance on the capital city with uh, satellite images uh, spotting a military convoy just north of Kiev in the early hours of this morning. Russian troops have reportedly uh, begun a ground assault in Kherson. Now this comes after at least 70 Ukrainian soldiers were killed after a Russian artillery hit a military base in a city between Kiev and Kharkiv. Now, according to the local media, the attack happened on Sunday and destroyed a Ukrainian military unit. Air sirens have begun blaring with uh, this morning. This was after more explosions were heard overnight in the cities throughout the country. The Russian army also reaching the southern Ukrainian city of Kherson, and this is near Moscow and uh, the controlled, or should I say the Moscow-controlled Crimea, uh, setting up checkpoints there on the outskirts of that particular city. All right, let's, let's get more on this conflict now and what it could mean for uh, continents like ours here in Africa. And we speak now uh, to the uh, Brentest Foundation's director, Dr. Greg Mills, who's going to talk to us from Warsaw this morning. Dr. Mills, thank you very much for your time. You have almost um, an eyewitness account of what is going on on the ground in Ukraine. Are you able to paint a picture for us of what is happening there right now? Well, I'm, I'm some distance away in Warsaw, but I was um, on the border with Ukraine over the weekend. Um, I mean, it's clear that the Russians are continuing to press home their attack on four axes, uh, from the north, from Belarusia, from the north, east, and the east, uh, from Russia itself, and then from the south, from Crimea. Uh, and each of those have encountered fairly serious Ukrainian resistance. I think the, the lesson here is that Ukrainians are, are not the Ukrainians of 2014. They're the Ukrainians of 2022. Uh, they are considerably better armed, uh, particularly with uh, anti-tank and uh, anti-air missiles. Um, and they certainly are emboldened and have the will to fight. Mm. Uh, you know, inevitably, when you're a nation of 40-something million people and you're up against a nation of 180 million people, you're probably going to suffer the consequences. But certainly, I think if Russia expected this to be a very quick and sudden capitulation on the part of the Ukrainians, that, that idea is now very far from their minds. And I would say that increasingly, as this conflict goes on, it's a struggle for the political survival of Vladimir Putin because his people are going to no more want Russians coming home in body bags in large number uh, and their economy imploding. And that's the other important front to this campaign. Yeah. Um, that, uh, you know, that that's going to affect their lives. And I think perhaps the most startling takeaway of all of this, other than the fact the Ukrainians have fought so hard and so gallantly, is the speed by which Europe has responded. We don't normally see the European Union as a very quick-moving animal, but it's like a cheetah in diplomatic terms. It's acted very quickly to isolate Russia, to see this fundamentally for what it is, which is an attack on a sovereign democratic country. Uh, um, and, and the types of sanctions that they have leveled against the Russians haven't been seen before. Extensive financial, extensive personal. It makes Africa's concerns about sanctions, we hear this on a daily basis from the Zimbabweans, for example, that's nothing by comparison to what the, the, the Russians are now uh, facing. And it's going to be very hard for those to be removed yeah. um, over time. And it's, we're going to come back on some of the statements that you make, Dr. Mills, particularly around the political survival of uh, the Russian President Vladimir Putin, particularly uh, with his country now being squeezed out of this uh, international banking system. But let me focus the attention for the moment on uh, what we saw yesterday. The Ukrainian President uh, Zelensky signing what appeared to be a document where he is asking to, quote-unquote, be immediately admitted into NATO or for his country to be admitted into NATO. The understanding is that that's not going to happen with a simple uh, stroke of the pen. How long is that process going to take? 
Well, I think it was, uh, if, I, if I saw the same report as you saw, it was uh, to, to apply to join the European Union. Indeed, indeed. Um, and uh, the, 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 but the, correctly, the um, attempt by Ukraine to join NATO has been in its constitution for some time now. Uh, and the Ukrainians, of course, this is what, to some extent, the fight is all about. Uh, the Russians don't want uh, NATO on their doorstep. Uh, and they want, and in addition to that, they see Ukraine very much as part of their cultural history, despite the arguments uh, about that. Uh, and um, uh, Putin has decided that, it's, that he'll take them over rather than have the risk of, of having a NATO member state on their doorstep. But such a process, I mean, it's certainly not going to happen now in terms of NATO membership, mm. although they're getting extensive NATO assistance particularly with weaponry, and I'm sure also intelligence and perhaps some special forces layers on. Um, but uh, European Union membership is a more interesting one. Um, they're not going to have it, if, of course, if they uh, get taken over by Russia. Mm. Uh, but, uh, and, and there are many laws and regulations to, the, to, Europe's, uh, membership, to European membership which would have to be complied with. Not least, it's you know the acquis communautaire, the set of laws and regimes that go with European Union membership. So it's certainly a long-term goal. But I think what Zelensky has done very brilliantly is actually kind of lead from the front. He's been seen very much as a man of the people. He is a former actor and comedian turned politician. In fact, he was got became interested in politics because he played the role of a history teacher who became politician in a sitcom. Uh, and uh, he's certainly a person with a very common touch and is able to use social media to very good effect, particularly Telegram. So he, he, he contrasts very markedly with the somewhat wooden, antiquated, ponderous approach taken by Vladimir Putin, who, who you know, doesn't appear to be flexible, doesn't appear to be dynamic, and certainly in the videos that we're seeing of him now, doesn't look particularly young. He seems a long way away from the Putin on horseback, which was the, the strongman image that he tried to project a few years ago. Yeah. So I would see the European Union membership application as something of a diplomatic ploy, but it really does indicate the extent to which the Ukrainians are looking west and not looking east in terms of their future. Dr. Mills, let me ask you to please uh, stay with us. We're going to take a break. When we return, we're going to ask Dr. Mills about uh, the scenes that we also saw uh, yesterday taking place where uh, African students seemed to be treated uh, shabbily with some saying that uh, it's actually racial discrimination that was happening at uh, the borders of the countries uh, that sit next to Ukraine. That conversation continues in a bit. Very good morning to you. If you're just joining us, uh, we are in conversation with uh, the Brenthurst Foundation's director, Dr. Greg Mills, who joins us from Warsaw in Poland, not too far from Ukraine, that country uh, coming under severe uh, pressure from Russia and uh, pressure in terms of military action being taken by Russia. Uh, Dr. Mills, let's pick up on the conversation that we saw uh, dominating the news headlines yesterday. 
yesterday, the African Union putting out a statement based on reports of racist behavior, uh, particularly by the Ukrainian soldiers, or should I say Ukrainian security forces, who seemed to be uh, displaying a rather unfortunate attitude towards uh, African students who were trying to leave Ukraine and get into uh, other nations such as the one where you are in Poland. And they said uh, in a statement, Doctor, and I just want to read uh, very briefly, I quote, respect international law and show the same sympathy and support to all people fleeing war, notwithstanding their racial identity. That's just a line from a statement that was released by the African Union. The people in Africa, Dr. Mills, they would have been uh, sympathetic towards the people of Ukraine, given that Russia has invaded Ukraine. But uh, some people will be asking the question, why should Africans be sympathetic towards uh, these people when they're going to display what is seen as racist behavior? Yeah, well, I didn't see the, the, the television coverage of that. Uh, what I can say is uh, what I saw with my own eyes, which is the, the extent of the queues leaving Ukraine now are just massive, um, that there are people spending up to 60 hours, I understand, in their vehicles sleeping on the side of the road. Um, and it just appears to be a massive crush of humanity trying to get out with, with upwards of half a million people just over the last 96 hours since war was declared. So I suspect in all of that there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, human sentiment, uh, emotion running high, human sentiments being, being battered and bruised. Uh, I can't speak about the specific allegations of racism. I did see myself groups of, um, of Africans at the border of Medinka, uh, in, into Poland, and they seem to be treated, from my perspective, just like everybody else was being treated. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, but the, the, blow, the flows of traffic over the border are really very slow. Um, there are, of course, multiple ingress points into various countries in Eastern Europe, um, but this is really slow to a terrific trickle, and one's heart has to go out for everybody who's trapped in, in Ukraine, Many African students there, uh, many medical students, engineering students, for example, and one would certainly like to see uh, everybody who wants to get out be able to get out as quickly as possible. Um, you know, I think that one of the long-term costs of this conflict is going to be about, you know, one, what, the, what does this mean in terms of Africa's position on the global map of relevance? Yeah. And in part, that's going to be answered by where Africa was in this conflict. And I, I found it very surprising myself that the majority of African governments have not said anything about the invasion of a democratic sovereign country by another one. It's almost as if they're trying to sort of decide who's going to win and then come out in support of one or the other, or that they don't care. I mean, you can take your, your pick as to which, which version of it is. Uh, I think ex post facto to use issues around refugee treatment, which may or may not be true, I don't know, um, as a justification for not supporting Ukraine uh, really flies in the face of fundamental principle. Yeah. The principle here is that one democratic country has been invaded by, in this instance, an authoritarian one um, in trying to reverse history by 30 years according to some, some thoughts of, of its leader. Uh, and if that was to happen in Africa, as the Kenyan uh, ambassador to the UN, Martin Kamani, so eloquently pointed out, if that was to happen in Africa, given our hodgepodge nature of our border systems and inherited uh, colonial structures, we would have endless systemic conflict between countries. So it sets an appallingly bad precedent. And I think we should keep our eye focused very much on the big picture here, which is what this means for us. And really, really, if we don't speak out against this, what does it mean for us going forward? There's going to be a tremendous amount of focus on rebuilding Ukraine. Yeah. Um, if it's under Russian control, probably not. But if it's under independent Ukrainian control, there's probably likely to be a, mis a redirection of resources. 
And Africa will probably suffer in that, and particularly Africa will suffer from that redirection of resources if they've been seen to be on the wrong side of history. And yep, we have to, as Africans, ask what it means to be on the right side of history. Sure. And I'm going to ask you in a moment what it is that African leaders should be saying at a time like this. And very interestingly, you speak about Africa's relevance. Yesterday, I had a conversation with the spokesperson of the AU who said that, look, as a continent, we should have a very big voice, particularly in organizations such as the UN Security Council. And the unfortunate part, she says, is that, yes, three African nations are represented in that Security Council. However, they don't have voting powers. And so what should be uh, the stance of African leaders and how weighty is their voice if you look back at the picture I've just painted for you that African leaders, yes, they are represented at the Security Council, but even their membership is not permanent. Well, I mean, the membership or the permanent membership of the Security Council, of course, has been a matter of endless debate. Uh, in part, it's because the five permanent members of the Security Council are not in agreement about themselves about its expansion. Uh, and they retain, they want to retain their veto power, and that includes China and Russia. Um, and it's because that those who, uh, who aspire to becoming members of the Security Council on a permanent or, or rotational basis themselves cannot agree how that process should, should eventuate and can't agree among themselves as to who should stand next in line for that permanent seat. So it's a bit of a standoff, really, uh, uh, in terms of, of the much overdue reform of that institution to reflect current global norms. Mm. But again, you know, are we putting the cart before the horse? We want to be more relevant, but we make ourselves irrelevant by not standing up on key issues of principle. We want to be seen as a continent of the future, but we look to protect regimes of the past. We want to be seen to be progressive, to be forward-looking, to put human security above state security, mm. but we do just the opposite. So, you know, it, it's, it's, we can blame many others and, and be world champions of victimhood, but actually the ones who are perpetuating these deep-seated injustices are in fact ourselves. Yeah. And, and it's really the protection of elites and elite interests fundamentally over the interests of people. And I do think that Russia and its attack on Ukraine provided a perfect opportunity to, to point out that Africa has changed. But what we have done so far, and it's early days yet, is we've actually pointed out that, you know, we, we don't have a, a dog in this fight, so we're going to keep our head down um, and we're not going to comment on it because there may be something to gain or to lose as a consequence of this. Uh, and anyway, it involves nasty imperialists on both sides. Mm. So we're not going to comment on this. When, in fact, we should be asking ourselves, is this not about key issues of, of humanity and of democracy that we professed to speak about? Let me and how on, earth can, how on earth can we ensure that others are interested in Africa when we're not interested in them? Dr. Mills, we literally have less than a minute left. I'm going to lump two questions in one. A more direct one about South Africa, given our history. The position of the country at the moment is that uh, the two sides must go to the negotiating table because nothing will get resolved without speaking to one another. But the second question to that is that we have a particular history with Russia. Uh, do you think the reason we are taking this almost neutral line is as a result of that history? And if we are to preserve that history then, what's the future of a person like uh, Vlad Vladimir Putin? Well, the great questions, as all of them have been. Um, let me ask the second one first. We have a great, you know, a long-standing history with Russia, big supporter of the ANC during the liberation struggle, but uh, so was Ukraine. Uh, I hosted a, a, the first public meeting in 1993 involving Umkonto Wesizwe and the then SAPF, and the Umkonto Wesizwe officer who came and spoke on that public platform was, in fact, trained uh, in, the, in the Black Sea Fleet uh, out of what is now today Ukraine. So the history is, is interlinked. 
They may be separate countries, but they were all part of the Soviet Union. And we were trying to make a division when, in fact, Ukraine supported South Africa extensively during the liberation struggle. In terms of, of what this means for South Africa and South African foreign policy, I, I think that what we've tried to do is to sort of cast this in the mold of our traditional beefs and arguments about the global order. We've also tried to bring it up to speed in terms of where our current sets of financial and commercial interests uh, link in. And we've also overlaid all the arguments with the Ukraine and Russia uh, about with a strong sense of ideology, an ideology which is largely, unfortunately, bankrupt today. Mm. And what we've done effectively is take sides uh, in a debate on the side against democracy and against uh, the peaceful resolution of conflict. It's almost impossible, last point, to have a peaceful resolution of conflict when someone is standing over you with their foot on your neck. It's not a very good, it's not an easy place to negotiate from. Mm -hmm. And Zelensky has said many times that he's willing to negotiate, but you can't negotiate when someone's just invaded your country. That's uh, Dr. Greg Mills. Thank you so much for your insights here. He is uh, the director at the Brenthest Foundation talking to us from Warsaw in Poland.